Just, uh, just a minute. Yeah, just a minute, guys. And just one moment. Yeah, I'm going to be multitasking because I just took a break from cashering here. So you'll just deal, you'll just basically um, work with me as I'm going to be very multitasking this morning. I might have to have people in the kitchen cashering as we speak here. So just in case I'm needed in the kitchen, I'll have to just turn around for a minute, see what's going on in the kitchen, and then come right back to you. Okay. So as long as you're happy with that, then we're going to proceed. Give me two minutes here. They just need something, which I'm struggling to find. But give it a minute. Here we go. Found it. All right, ladies and gents, the one question that often comes up is about Gebrachts. You're familiar with Gebrachts, and if you're not familiar with it, let me take the opportunity to share with you a little bit about Gebrachts, and then maybe we could do some insights, some ideas about the Seder that you'll all certainly find interesting. So let's discuss this very interesting debate about this concept called Gebrachts. What is Gebrachts? Gebrachts actually is a Yiddish word that refers to something literally and he's broken apart. So we'll talk about that. We're talking here about broken apart matzah. Okay, you might have heard of matzah shriya, which means soaked matzah. So the question is, can you soak your matzah and eat it? Which means, can you dip your matzah into your chicken soup? Can you, you know, if you like doing that on Shabbos, perhaps at the chala, or how about crumbling your matzah into your gefilte fish or whatever it is that you like to have it with? How about kanedlach, right? Matzah balls. And you'll actually note that there's many people who don't do that. Many people who their matzah is not in any way. On Pesach, they make sure not to have. In fact, if you come to our Pesach retreat program here, we will have kanedlach only on the last day of Pesach. On the first days of Pesach, we make a different type of kanedlach which is a potato-based one. So it's different than what you're typically used to. And this is a matter that was actually a debate in Jewish communities, even to this very day, about gebrachts. Okay? So let's, let's, go, let's backtrack a little bit. You know, it's quite rare to find a substance that is so utterly and uncompromisingly rejected by the Torah. There are other foods whose consumption is forbidden, right? Can't have blood, bacon, horse meat. Anything that's not kosher, you can't eat. Cheeseburgers. But this, the Torah forbids us to eat, to derive benefit in any way. On Pesach, you cannot sell chametz. You cannot feed it to your animal. You can't use it for anything. You can't even keep it in your possession which is a reminder to you, ladies and gentlemen, to make sure that you actually sell your chametz before Pesach. Very, very important that your chametz is sold. The Basin will sell your chametz for you. If you haven't sold it yet, you can go onto our website, ChabadSouthAfrica.org, where we can facilitate the sale of your chametz that it will not be owned by a Jew during Pesach. So, basically, usually any forbidden substance becomes nullified, right? You can be mavatalit if it mixes into something of a much greater quantity. Take, there's a general rule called bitl b'shishim. What's bitl b'shishim? If something falls, let's say a little bit of milk falls into your pot. You know, a very basic example that I could think of that just came up, somebody asked me about this morning. So it's very relevant. Their milchig spoon by mistake went into the dishwasher of non, of uh, fleshigs, okay, of, of meat. 
does that make their dishwasher now treif? And the answer very simply is it doesn't. Why? Because there's a lot more than 60 times any substance that could have been on that spoon, that milk spoon that was inside the dishwasher. So the general rule is if something is batl b'shishim, if it's nullified 60 times, then there's no problem. You can still eat the rest of that meat. Obviously, there are more complicated situations. There are certain times where maybe there's a financial loss consideration that's taken into that, that's taken into consideration there. But usually any forbidden substance can become nullified if the other um, substance, food that it gets mixed in, is 60 times greater or more than they than the other. Okay. But when it comes to chametz, the Torah says it's asr b'mashu, which means the Torah forbids even the slightest trace, even if it blends with something a million times its volume. The entire lot becomes unfit for consumption. Chametz, Torah tells us, is asr b'mashu, zilch. You cannot have any chametz on Pesach. Bal yera'e, bal yematze. You shouldn't find it, you shouldn't see it. That's why we sell it, so it doesn't belong to us. So the Torah tells us not to eat it, not to possess it, nothing. During this entire time, it's written clearly in the Torah. So obviously we're spending our time this week cleaning up our homes, making sure that it's completely cleansed of all chametz. And on Thursday night, actually my home, we're going to do it tomorrow night, because Thursday night we do it at the hotel for all of our guests. We actually search our home for chametz. We do what you would maybe call a search for any solemn survivors of chametz because we are meant to get rid of all of our chametz before Pesach. So this is just a ritual of making it realistic. The whole week we're cleaning up, but now we're taking a moment to search our home extra for the chametz. Anything. A breadcrumb, a beer, uh, 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 some pasta, anything in which a grain of, of chametz would, you know, flour and water would come together in any way, that would be chametz, and that's not tolerable. In fact, I should say this year, it's more like for 10, uh, 10 days, if you want to say that because Shabbos comes, although you can have chametz on Shabbos, you can't have chametz around for Pesach. So it really has to be kept in a very protected way that the chametz won't be around during Pesach. So let's just quickly clarify what's the definition of chametz. Simply flour from any of the five grains of wheat, spelt, barley, oats, and or rye. When the flour is mixed with water and remains unbaked for more than 18 minutes, that's chametz. So wheat flour usually has an enzyme, okay, which breaks down the starch into sugar, into glucose. That sugar is then converted into alcohol. So when alcohol evaporates, the dough rises. Now rice, for example, does not have that element other enzymes obviously are there, but does not have that fermentation. That's why many sages don't allow rice. It is too similar to chametz. Obviously, Sephardim do eat rice. But I don't want to digress into that because I wanted to focus on gebrachts, which is not chametz. But here's what you need to understand. Gebrachts, like we said earlier, means broken apart. Okay, so it could perhaps be matzah that's broken up. Maybe what they call in Hebrew matzah shruya, matzah that's soaked. So the question is, can I soak my matzah in water to eat it? Can you dip your matzah in your soup or into uh, what do we call it? Kenaid, like we said before. Now, you would, many Jews do it, so I'm not going to disqualify it right here. But the basic rule is, once dough is baked, it cannot ferment. It cannot become chametz. It's already 
matzah, it's not chametz. So very clearly, even if you don't eat gebrak on Pesach, we are not to in any way accuse anyone who does eat kenedlach or the like as doing something wrong. What I want to do today is to explain to you in case many people wonder why in Chabad and many other circles we don't eat gebrakts. Why am I at Pesach retreat or in any Chabad shul, you're not going to find matzah balls on Pesach. So if that's of interest to you, stay tuned because that's what I want to talk about. When you mix flour and water, it's only going to rise whilst it's dough. But after it's baked, after it becomes matzah, that's not going to happen. So that's very clear. And therefore, it's, you know, not in any way, anyone, no one should feel uncomfortable if your custom is to eat kneidlach or matzah dipped on Pesach. In fact, let me share with you a very favorite story of mine. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, used to conduct a Seder at 770 Eastern Parkway. He moved to New York in 1940 and bought the iconic building that is the Lubavitch World Headquarters. And upstairs from the shul was his apartment. And many people would participate in the Seder, including the Rebbe and his wife, including their brother-in-law, Rabbi Shmaryahu Garari, and his wife, Rabbi Tzanchana. And uh, many others would participate. And once there was a guest, and obviously, you know, in Chabad custom, we don't mix anything with our matzah. There was a guest at the Seder table who didn't know that that's a Chabad custom and was taking the matzah and putting it into the chrein. They had like a beets, you know, uh, we call it chrein, beets with horseradish, or maybe it was another beet salad on Pesach, which I'm sure there's some liquid in there, like water that's gonna make it um, liquidy. And they were taking the matzah and sticking it in. One of the yeshiva bachram, like gave the guy a kick and said, hey, now under the table, don't you know the Chabad custom is not to do that? That's called the gebrachts. And the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, got wind of it and made an announcement at the table. He said, it's better that the matzah become red than someone's face should blush red from embarrassment. Very important to keep that in mind. It's a very powerful story that I think illustrates the significance of making sure that it's not only about the law, but also about the spirit of the law. That it's not only that the matzah shouldn't become red being soaked in the chrein, but make sure that we're not only careful about the matzah that goes into our mouths, we're also, about, we're also scrupulous about what comes out of our mouths. How many of us have seen in the past, what was it, the last month, how many millions of people, it's the last week, so it's a week older story, a week and a half of of what's her name? Come on. See, I don't even care about her name. Uh, whatever from the royal family, the breakaway, right? On Oprah Winfrey's show. Harry and, and uh, whatever her name is. Okay. All the schmutz that's been sheared, right? What did you want to say, Lester? Her name is Megan. Megan, Megan Merkel. There you go. Getting old, forgetting even current contemporary news. The point I'm making is, in fact, it's a verse. Let me ask you guys a question. What do you think is the most often used verse in the entire Torah? Anyone know? You'll have it lots in this week's Parsha and last week's Parsha throughout. I know this week we're going to be reading the Parsha on Shabbos, but uh, it gets overshadowed by Pesach, but we still read the Parsha, Parsha Tzav. The words are, Vayedaber Hashem El Moshe Lemar. God spoke to Moshe saying, now, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, you might be familiar with him, very great rabbi known as Rebbe. He was the compiler of the Mishnah over 1,800 years ago. He asks a question. Every word in Torah is precise. So why the extra word God spoke to Moshe saying? Don't we already know God spoke to Moshe? Why do we have to say, you know, the next, the extra word saying, Lamar? And he explains that the word Lamar tells us that anything Moshe said, he actually had consent, permission from God to relay that information, to tell it over. We have to ask ourselves. Perhaps Google should be asking that question. And Facebook and all the other social media outlets, Twitter, 
Do they have permission to, to spy on us and to share our information? And we should be careful about that. These days where they're living dead, last week someone cursed out the, the Zulu king, and then I don't know how many people saw Amos Oz was uh, lambasted by his daughter. He's deceased, can't defend himself. Talks, whatever the case is, the matzah reminds us, yeah, that we're careful about what's going in. We're going to be very careful about that. We also have to be careful about what comes out of our mouths. Okay, that was a, a play that I, I just um, plagiarized a vart from the Baal Shem Tov, which he spoke about in general, Kashrut. The idea of Kashrut was, he says, you know, you got to be careful about what goes in. Also be careful about what comes out. So remember that just matzah that's soaked is still kosher. The question is, why in Chabad are we careful not to eat soaked matzah? And in not just Chabad, many communities are really careful about and, and refrain from eating any matzah or any matzah products like ground matzah, matzah meal, that came in contact with any liquids on Pesach. Now, the thing is, matzah is very simple. It's, what is it? Flour and water, right? That, that was baked very quickly, very speedily, thoroughly blended and baked. Go into Google you could watch a, on YouTube a video of Shmura Matzah Bakery, how it's done. And once it's baked, the flour and water is not going to rise. It's not going to, it's not going to leaven. So what's the problem? Mix it with anything else. What's the big deal? But the truth is, this is something that's been debated long, long ago. Let me share it with you from the Gemara Psachim. For those of you following the daily study of Gemara, this week there will be, in fact, I think it's, was it today or yesterday, the Siyum, the completion of the tract of Pesachim, which is fascinating because now we're approaching Pesach and we finish the Talmud tractate of Pesachim and I think we move on to Shkolem. Whatever the case is, the Gemara says that Rav Papa, one of the great rabbis and one of the great Talmudic sages, he permitted the bakers in his house to line the pots with something that's called chassisi on Pesach. Those are the words of the Gemara. Now, what is chassisi? So the Gemara tells us chassisi is matzah meal that's cooked into water. Okay, ground matzah that was cooked into water. So obviously, they seem to have been enjoying Kneidlach 1,800 years ago in the Talmud. No, that seems to be what, what seems to be implied. But the Talmud tells us that one of the other sages, Rava, how he reacted. First of all, he said, is it possible that someone should permit this where there are servants? In other words, since there are servants in the house of this rabbi, he was actually a great rabbi, then it was common for them to, you know, take as an example, I'm right now in a hotel where we're koshering the hotel. We actually apply even greater stringencies in a hotel. Why is that? I don't expect that the wonderful people here who aren't Jewish, who are here to help us and to serve us, I don't expect them to be proficient in the laws of Pesach and kosher, that they should be as careful as me. So therefore, I need mashkichim. In your house, you don't have mashkiach. Why? Because you are in your house. A mashkiach is a supervisor. In your house, you know what's going on. And even if you have non-Jewish people in your home who are helping you out, you're there, you're present. My, uh, my assistants, my domestic helpers, they, they fairly well know the laws of kosher ben -anab. They don't know it as well as my wife and I know it, but they pick up on it. They, they are familiar with it. And we're always around with them that we could correct if there's any mistakes. But when you're going to an industrial kitchen in a hotel or in a restaurant, you need a mashkiach who is a kosher supervisor, who's proficient in the laws of kosher, and is able to, and, and actually in some ways they might be more strict then you would be in your own home because the staff around are not familiar. In this hotel where we kosher the kitchens and we blow torch all the surfaces and we boiled everything up and we we're going through this, it's a very tedious and meticulous process. I don't expect the staff to know everything. And that's why I need people to be supervised. So Rava back then said that if you have workers in your house who aren't Jewish and are not familiar with the kosher laws, then you have to be that much stricter. That's, Point number one. And Rava says, I myself use this chassisi. But he says in a place where there's so many servants who aren't familiar with the kosher laws, he questioned it. 
So that's the story in the Gemara. Now, how do we understand Rava's reaction? Was he being critical or was he approving? One way that Talmud analyzes the story is to say, Rava saying in your own home, perhaps you could be lenient because in your own home, you know what's going on and there's no concern that anybody's going to confuse the matzah meal with other flour. Because Rava's concern is that maybe if somebody sees ground matzah that looks just like flour, they're going to say, oh, you could use regular flour. They use regular flour, mix it with water, it's going to become chametz. So one perspective is Rava saying in your own home, you know what your ingredients are, do as you please. As long as you're doing, observing kosher, right? But elsewhere in a hotel, you have to be stricter. Why be stricter? Because the staff aren't familiar with your laws. Another perspective the Talmud mentions is that Rubba's reactions don't dispute each other. Rather, Rubba says that if there is concern that others are going to come to confuse the matzah with flour, then you're forbidden to use the matzah milk. And this is why he took issue with Rav Papa, who was dealing with a more, you know, if you're the chief rabbi and there's all these staff around, or you're in a hotel as we are, then he's saying that's why you need to be more stringent, but in your own home, that, that's the basic understanding of it. I don't know. I mean, you're not seeing here. There's people walking around. We have coffee machines being cashed. We have a lot going on around me right now. I'm being distracted by it, but hopefully you're not. Now, obviously, this is telling us is that in this type of situation, there's a difference between your own home and outside your house. Okay? Another interesting thing. You know, I'm drinking coffee. I'm in a non-kosher establishment. Kosher, coffee is generally kosher. Um, I'm careful about Chalav Yisrael. So the milk that I use is soy milk, which is kosher, and it's not a concern. But you know, if you're having coffee after a fleshig dinner, you know what it says in Shulchan Aruch? You should put the bottle of soy milk on the table. Why? Or almond milk, actually, is more mentioned there because soy milk is more contemporary. So nobody should think that you are having milk after meat, which is forbidden. So meaning within Jewish law, there's concern about what other people think. Oftentimes people say, I do what I want. I'm not worried about what other people think. But Jewish law says otherwise. Jewish law says you should be concerned about what other people think because that's called maratayim. If I walk into McDonald's to use the bathroom and you're looking at me and say, hold on, the rabbi is walking into McDonald's. What's he coming out with? I have to be concerned about what other people see and what other people are going to think, Right? So this is a matter in Jewish law. If the matzah meal looks like flour, I have to be concerned that people are going to look at it and say, "Am I? are we using flour on Pesach? And obviously there's potato flour, there's almond flour, there's different types of flours that one can use. But this is giving you a little bit of background so you understand the concerns of Gebrachts that was a concern on Pesach, why we're so careful not to mix, not to have Gebrachts on Pesach, to ensure that we're not going to in any way confuse real flour that's mixed with water or, or matzah flour. So you understand that Rava and Rav Papa did allow this chassisi, which is basically matzah flour that was mixed with water, and they weren't concerned about it. So you could see already in Talmudic times that it was something that was done. So when did it become a problem that we today do not eat gebrachts in the Hasidic tradition. When did, where did that happen? And I imagine actually it's probably rooted and sourced much further back. And unfortunately I can't pick up, you could see I, I don't have my PowerPoints or any, um, I, didn't, I wasn't able to prepare today. We were busy kashering the whole time so I couldn't prepare one of those types of shiurim with all the bells and whistles. Maybe tomorrow we could do one more of those. But let me go into Shulchan Aruch and to show you there, because that's sort of the final word. Shulchan Aruch is, is where the law was put into more contemporary times, where the concern of Gebrachts became more of, a, of an issue. Okay? In his Shulchan Aruch Harav, the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneur Zaman of Liadi says as follows. Since nowadays, we can clearly see that even after baking, 
there is some visible flour left on the surface of matzah. So the Alter Rebbe says that those few particles of raw flour are at risk of leavening should they come in contact with water. That's his concern. Not with something that's already ground up, not with something that's already baked. His concern is that today we're in a mass industrial era where everything is done, mass production. His concern is actually this flour that's not been properly baked. So that's why he says that in earlier generations, it wasn't such a problem. Maybe they baked more properly back then. So no particle of, of flour was left as a concern that would perhaps become fresh dough. All the dough was baked in the oven and cannot become leavened. But he says that today, and this is already two centuries ago, he says that we're dispersed around the world and people are in a hurry and, and rush things. And he says he sees that a lot of matzah has flour on it. Now, let me ask you, do you find ever that there's flour on your matzah? I find it. I find sometimes you open a box of matzah and you can find particles of flour there. So the question might be, who cares if some flour was not needed? Well, it all goes into the oven, no? So here we come to another interesting dispute. Rashi, foremost commentator of the Torah, is, the, is of the opinion that once flour or even kernels of wheat have been roasted or baked, they will never become chametz, even if they're placed in water. But a contemporary of his, uh, Rambam, actually Rambam was a little bit before, um, I don't know, I think they're around the same time. Rambam rules that while roasted flour will not become chametz, but kernels of wheat will not be fully dried out in the oven because the flour is covered by the shell of the wheat. So he's saying flour that comes from these roasted kernels should not be put in water on Pesach. There's other sages of that time, Rabbi Yerucham, the Snak, other great commentators, people familiar with the laws who felt that even flour roasted in an oven can still become chametz. And if we want to take a more stringent opinion, if we want to do our very best, as the Ariza said, one who's careful about chametz and Pesach will be protected against sinning the entire year. So if there's no flour left in the matzah, obviously there's no problem. But the Alter Rebbe tells us that oftentimes you open a box of matzah and you still find specks of flour that were not fully baked or somehow they're still there. And that's his concern. So this is what we call a chumrah or hidur mitzvah. And that is something that Ariza really emphasized. We should try to be more scrupulous on Pesach. So it's certainly a chumrah, a stringency. It's not in any way disparaging those who don't follow this, this, uh, this, this stringency. But at the same time, to understand that there's, you know, obviously if somebody's not doing this, is being more lenient, we're not in any way disparaging anybody who eats kenedlach on Pesach. Okay? So I think it's fear. I think, in fact, I should add another detail. That, that is written in the Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch. He wrote before, he wrote this all before the commercial matzah bakeries that we see today. Remember I gave you a discussion we had a, a week and a half ago about the um, machine-made matzahs, right? If you go to a matzah bakery and hang up your hat in the room, I've done this before, put your jacket down, okay? Come back after a couple of minutes, and you are going to see your jacket is, is powdery. You're going to find specks of flour. You're going to think that it's snow in this room. Okay. So that's why I, I, I tell you, you open a box of matzah. You're not going to see it. It's not as noticeable in a box of matzah. But certainly, there's flour flying all over the place. So the two main reasons that I mentioned in Shulchan Aruch. The two main reasons I mention a shochan, are, are mentioned in Shulchan Aruch. Number one is the possibility of confusing matzah meal with flour. And number two, the second reason is the chance of flour remaining on the matzah, which, like I said, is very practical. And um, see, Cynthia, you mentioned here about the matzah. 
You could open that package. I don't know if you'll for sure see it. If, you, if anyone here did not get matzah from me, please touch base and we'll try to get you matzah as soon as possible. Maybe when I'm back from Hunter's Rest before Pesach. But you'll notice in the Shmura matzah that it's very easily that you could find flour on it. And therefore, that's the concern that if there is some flour there, that it can become chametz if it's mixed with water. Okay, so that's the, that is the, uh, the basics of it. Now, at the same time, there are many great rabbis who do accept mixing uh, matzah with the, matzah with the, with water. And they felt that, you know, it's just a stringency. And therefore, if you eat your knedlach, gesunta hate, enjoy it. There are many poskim, many halachic authorities who are not concerned about these points that I mentioned to you today. Like I said, it is a stringency that within the Hasidic circles, we're very, very careful about, but not everybody is. So that's, uh, that's an important point. Any questions about this that come to mind? Okay. So I have a few other, I'm losing my, 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 train of thought. I want to go into the last days of Pesach because that's where on the last day of Pesach, that's next, not this coming Sunday, but the Sunday afterwards. In fact, there's a little uh, a cute little story that comes to mind. Um, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, one of the great Torah leaders of the previous generation, he was the Rosh Yeshiva of Torah Vadas, Yeshiva where I grew up in, in Brooklyn. He did not eat Kibraks and they asked him why. He's a Litvak. The Litvaks uh, Lithuanian Jews, which most South Africans are, were not of uh, this opinion to be so stringent as we in Chabad are. So he said that he was a student in Slabatka. And when he was there, he was invited to eat a meal on Pesach. And he doubted the kosher status of the soup in the home where he was eating. But not to insult the host, he said he doesn't eat gebrachts. So that's how he got out of eating the soup. He said, once I told them that I don't eat gebrachts. He said, so from then on, I stopped eating gebrachts. Just a cute little story that came to mind of Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, which I think uh, you could see even a Lithuanian rabbi. So if you're, if you're a Litvak, even still, you might want to consider the stringency on Pesach. But let's go to the eighth day of Pesach, when even in the Hasidic circles, we do eat gebrachts and we do eat Kenedlach on Pesach, the last day. And why is it? If we're so strict about it all seven days before, why in the eighth day does it become permissible? Right? Why do we do that? And there are several reasons that, were, that, that are given that I saw. One comes from the Bnei Yisachar, Rabbi Tzvi Elimelech of Dinov. And he says that the issue of Gebrachts because it is a chumrah, it is a stringency, it's a custom. So in order, to, in order to differentiate between what's rabbinic, between what's custom, what's law, he says the last day of Pesach outside of Israel is rabbinic, right? In Israel, Pesach will end next Shabbos. Here in South Africa, we have an extra day and it ends Sunday night. So he says, therefore, to differentiate between the biblical and the rabbinic, between the custom and the law, so there's one day that we actually do eat it. That's one answer I saw. Got it? Answer number one is to distinguish between custom and law. Customs are very important, but we have to know the difference. In fact, customs are so important that when it comes to the Manishtana, the four questions that we ask at the Seder, in the, Chabad, in the Chabad tradition, we start off with which one of the four questions? Right. Why is this not different from all the nights? Most people start off with the question, and all of the nights, we eat. You can eat bread or matzah. But on this night, we eat only matzah. That is the common way. In the Hasidic version of the four questions, same four questions, we start off with 
Chol halelois ain't on a mat bilin a filu pa mechos. I lazesh de pa me. All other nights of the year, you want to dip, you don't want to dip, do what you want. On this night, we are instructed to dip twice. Is it biblically instructed? No, it's a custom. Tradition, tradition, right? And yet tradition is so important in Judaism that in these four questions in the Hasidic tradition, we ask first about the customs and then about the law to symbolize the importance of custom. Yet the Bnei Yisachar says the reason why the last day of Pesach, which is rabbinic, we eat gebrachts to show there's a difference between custom and law. So that's one answer I saw. Another I saw was, forgetting the source of it, but he says the idea is to create that unity, an idea of that we're all, that all Jews are the same. So, so to say on the last day, even those who are stringent will eat gebrachts because yes, it's a custom, but we could all eat from, from the same bowl of soup, so to say. I once went to Israel for Pesach and I was going to relatives who eat gebrachts. I asked my rabbi, what do I do? They eat gebrachts, I don't. He said, so don't eat the soup, you know? Don't make a big deal. When it comes to a custom like this, don't create family foribles. Seder Pesach is about family unity. We spoke, we see how Megan Merkel split the family of guy. Well, horrible. Every family has its skeletons. And as we could all see, the royal family also has skeletons. So there's nothing wrong than understanding that each family has its quirks and its problems. We all do. We're human. But we don't have to ear it on the Oprah Winfrey show. We don't have to go to the world and tell the world about our problems. Yeah, so we have problems. Everybody's got problems. And in this day of Pesach, we try to emphasize the unity of the community. So while beautiful to follow the Arizal and all those who are more stringent, the last day of Pesach, we're all going to join together. It's kosher. It's beautiful. Let's all enjoy the same bowl, so to say. But uh, th there is, in Chabad custom, we mix the matzah on the last day with everything, with the soup, with the fish, with the meat. In fact, I think one of the rebbers even stuck it into the grape juice. Like everything was mixed with, was, was mixed with, um, every bit of matzah was mixed with like every dish that was served. And he explained because on a spiritual level, chametz, which is the idea of, of ego, that's uh, our inflated ego, right? Because bread rises. Chamet symbolizes that arrogance, smugness, ego. And he explains the idea that on Pesach, we are uncompromising. We have to deflate our egos. We have to eliminate it. When we left Egypt, we needed recovery. We needed to liberate ourselves from years of toxicity as slaves in Pharaoh's Egypt. And what's the greatest obstacle to recovery and healing? The, the inability to be vulnerable, to be raw and honest and humble. Other negative traits, you might say, could be tolerable, sometimes useful in, in, in certain doses, right? Depression, for example, you know, it, it, depression is no good. But it's part of the human condition that sometimes we feel down. And we obviously are commanded to serve God with joy. And, and I'm not in any way advocating that people should be depressed. But the sages talk about a small dash sometimes of melancholy counterbalances our, our, our joy, right? To feel bad if I've done something wrong is not a bad thing. It's good. So there is, there is good depression, not if we stay in the rut and remain depressed. I'm talking about when a person feels bad and there are times for this, like, right, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we, we talk about, oh, Shamnu, but God knew I sinned. I did this wrong. I did that. We don't have to live your life telling yourself all the things you've done wrong. But there are times in life where you look at your shortcomings in order to improve, in order to become better. So there are times in life where we need to reflect on our failures, on our disappointments, because that's the only way we can identify them and rectify them. And the same thing you could apply to almost anything. We just read it in Hayom Yom the other day that, that, that we look at our shortcomings. They actually are there to improve us. Take, for example, anger. Right? A person gets angry. Anger is not a good thing. 
But that means you have within you, 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 you should use your anger to get upset about things that, you know, uh, human rights abuses and problems in society. That you have every right in the world to get angry about. So use your hot-headedness for such a purpose. Right? So every negative character trait has a time when it can be applied, a time when it can be used. You know, we're in vaccine season, right? We're all trying to get our jabs. I mean, thank God I got mine a month ago. Um, thank God, Baruch Hashem. I, for the first day or two afterwards, I felt a little bit out of my uh, comfort zone. I had a little bit of fever. But what I'm saying is that sometimes negative character traits are like a vaccine dosage. In a sense, right? Too much, too fast, too big of a dosage is not good. But if you have a little bit of a little dosage of, of the negative character trait, it helps us to counterbalance our, our, uh, the rest of us. Arrogance, though, ego, that on Pesach is completely forbidden. Completely forbidden. Yes, there is a healthy self-esteem that's different than your ego. If a person is, is smug, if they're arrogant, then they can't really truly um, heal. They'll never grow. You have to get rid of that chametz, that ego. That's why the matzah's flat. It's about humility, simplicity, simple faith. So on Pesach, we're going to focus and we're going to emphasize on our, our humility, right? We begin our journey towards our faith, towards truth, towards liberation. No ego allowed. Healing can only come if we open ourselves up without the smallest speck of that vanity, of that smugness. Even the most distant remnant of ego on, cham- on Pesach is chametz, forbidden. We run away from it. But hey, what happens after Pesach? Why do we go back to eat chametz if ego is no good? Right? And obviously, one who's still burdened with negative drives and emotions lacks that ability to truly liberate themselves. That's, that's the arrogance. But now we're going to get to, you eliminated the arrogance. Now you're able to work on a healthy self-esteem. You're, you're, you're able to rebuild that aspect in ourselves because we worked on ourselves. We eliminated the ego. We worked on our humility, right? So we need to celebrate our identity. We need to be proud of our talents, of our, of our abilities, right? Pride is not destructive. Ego is destructive. So now once you completely eliminated the ego, the chametz, now you could work on that type of a pride. So the gebrachts is, so to say, that segue into going into that, back into chametz, into working on a healthy ego. And actually, in the times of the Beis HaMikdash, it was in a sense Pesach all year. We read it in last week's parish. All grain offerings had to be unleavened, right? It says no yeast, no honey. We read that in last week's parsha. So that reflects the idea that in the temple, arrogance was completely, completely to be eschewed, completely toxic and poisonous. But nevertheless, there was a time after Pesach on Shavuos that we offered the Shnei Alechem, the two loaves of bread that the Torah tells us. Chametz, baked leavened bread. Baked leavened bread that was brought and offered in the Beis HaMikdash on Shavuos. So only after you went through the process of eliminating our ego during Pesach. Now we have 49 days of refinement, 49 days of working on ourselves, Right? Now, what do we do during the, during the sphere? We don't just count the days. We make the days count. We work on ourselves. We refine ourselves. We look at the seven character traits, the seven mitos. And every day we work on a different one, seven times seven. So the two work together, 49 in total. Every combination of these, of these character traits, of these attributes that we work on refining within ourselves. Ah, now comes Shavuos. You need that you need that aspect. In fact, the Torah was given to us where? Not in a valley. Not a, that, that might symbolize humility better. But on a mountain. But on a humble mountain. Not the biggest. Not on Table Mountain. Not on Kilimanjaro. Not on Mount Everest. Where is the Torah given? Mount Sinai. A humble mountain. 
So that's that's the uh, that's the story with with uh, chametz and gebrachts. I hope I explained it. I think I made a a mountain out of a mohel. I uh, tried to explain the idea. In short, is that why we're careful in Chabad, but understandably, if other people do eat their kanedlach, uh, not to in any way disparage it, there's nothing wrong. And uh, let's, ju- let's just think about how we could apply these ideas of beautifying our mitzvahs, which is obviously the reason why we're careful about the gebrachts on Pesach in the Chabad circles. And obviously now, we left Egypt 3,333 years ago, a very significant number this year. And we're working on reaching our ultimate exodus, our ultimate redemption, which is the coming of Mashiach. And what day of Pesach do we highlight the final redemption? The last day of Pesach, the day when we eat Gebrachts, right? And in fact, the Haftorah reading of the last day of Pesach, Achron Shah Pesach, a week from this Sunday, is from the book of Isaiah. We read from the uh, Torah, the prophets, describing the coming of Mashiach and the harmonious perfection of a time when the world will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. So the last day of Pesach, we have a special meal called Mashiach Suda, the feast of Mashiach in the afternoon towards the end of Pesach. In, uh, you could call it the farewell meal of Pesach. Many people have uh, it, it, a final meal to bid farewell to Pesach. And the Baal Shem Tov insisted that at that meal we should have matzah, we should have wine, we should have all the goodies of Pesach as we say goodbye to Pesach till next year. And obviously, actually, something fascinating that comes to mind, if you look at the sphere, the counting on the last day of Pesach, it's one day of, of counting sphere, right? So what is that? Chesed of Malchus, I think. We achieve a taste of the perfection of Shavuos, which is six weeks away from that. When we work towards the leaven the, the, that was brought in the, in the Beis Amikdash, the loaves, of, the loaves of bread. So obviously outright chametz is still forbidden because it's rabbinically still considered Pesach on that day but we're getting a taste of it. We're getting that, that potential because what's the idea? I worked on myself, I refined myself, and now I'm in a position to have that healthy pride, that healthy self-esteem. And so at that last meal, the Sudas Mashiach, we indeed eat whatever, all the goodies of Pesach, and you can mix your, you could mix your matzah into whatever you like. And in fact, we extend Pesach just a little bit. Many people have a custom of benching after it's dark. Why? So you could say the Yalav the Yavo when it's when Pesach is over and take that spirit of Pesach, whatever we learned over Pesach and embraced into the rest of the year. Now, obviously, you're not going to be observing Pesach after the eight days. You can't add, we're not taking Pesach into the rest of the year in a literal sense, but you want to take that spirit of Pesach into the year because. You worked on yourself, you refined yourself, you liberated yourself, you broke free from your boundaries, from your constraints, from your limitations, and you want to say the rest of the year, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to do what I can to break free from whatever challenges, struggles, not just on Pesach, but that idea of Pesach should go into the end of the year. So this year, Pesach is just a few days away. Let's get a taste of that liberation, of that freedom. Let's break free from our limitations. Let's be in touch with our true selves, like the matzah, which is about simplicity. Just go back to the basic faith with which our ancestors left Egypt. And let's experience that faith in ourselves. Let's work on ourselves. And once we have refined ourselves, then truly for the rest of the year, we're in a more liberated way that we could extend those aspects of Pesach to the rest of the year. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, I hope you all got an understanding. Of I've the got idea. a question. <laughs> yes, Leonie? I've got Leonie? a question, Rebbe. Yeah. So must, must we not, I'm not sure, it, must we not use matzah meal at all? 
Um, if you want to follow the Chabad tradition, then don't use matzah meal. But otherwise, other communities do it. And if you're accustomed to eat matzah meal, you're allowed to. So again, to recap, you're allowed to use matzah meal. But if you want to follow Chabad tradition, then you, would, then you won't use it. But Jewish law says you're allowed to. Okay. And I have another question. Sorry, sure. can I? Yeah, yeah, um, we're, we're listening. Uh, uh, as you know, I live in a home that the owner of the home is Gentile. Right. Now, now the Kobitz uh, Pesach, I don't yeah. know what to do. I thought the only thing I could do yeah. is not to share the, 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 the lamb, is maybe not to have lamb. And have you're allowed to have you're allowed to have lamb at your seder, you just can't um, roast it, okay? So if you want to have uh, lamb chops at your pesach seder, gesund to hate, cook it, but don't roast it. Cook it with liquid, bake it with liquid, but don't roast it. Don't because it, roasting it is symbolic of the carbon pesach. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. It's a great relief. Thank you. Okay. No, no, you're allowed to have and lamb. In fact, many people specifically will have lamb because it's delicious. It's symbolic of, uh, of the carbon Pesach, but we want to make sure that we don't do it in the same way as the carbon Pesach would be, which the carbon Pesach was roasted. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank Lester, you very no much. Any other questions? Rebbe, I think I, I have a question, please. Yes, Lester. If, if you're born into a, a community, into a culture that observes a certain kumra, a stringency, like yeah. not eating the brooks or halab Yisrael or not eating kidney or, or whatever. Right. Can you change your culture? Can you move to a different group? Very interesting, good question. Am I, am, I, am I stuck here not eating kidney or forever? You, yeah, you're not Sephardi. Maybe when Mashiach comes, all, all, all of us will uh, change. We'll all become Sephardi then. Um, the answer basically is we only upgrade, we don't downgrade. Now, I'm not going to say that's a downgrade. For a Sephardi, that's, that's totally fine. And it's so, interesting, it's basically become a tradition. To tell you the truth, there are some Ashkenaz communities that have embraced eating kitniot, but we don't do that. Um, the basics, I would say, is we, we don't change our custom. It's only eight days. You could get on for eight days without rice, can't you? No, yes, yes. But, you know, just I'll in, tell you in, where in you do little. find it. If a woman gets married, generally the custom is she takes on the customs of her husband. So in that instance, when a woman gets married to a, let's say your Ashkenazi marry a, a Sephardic, your husband's Sephardic, because the, the family has to follow one, you know, you got to follow one custom. It's going to be very confusing for the kids to have, you know, this, <laughs> this mix. So generally speaking, they follow the husband, the fathers. And that's, uh, you know, so if, a, if an Ashkenazi woman marries a Sephardic husband, and they would switch to that. It's interesting because I know a a woman who comes from a Chabad background, yeah. who married an Ashkenazi man. Yeah, she keeps these Chabad chumrot for herself, but she obviously doesn't impose it on the rest of her family. Right. Because her mother-in-law was complaining to me the other day that uh, you know she has to make special food or take special considerations when her daughter-in-law comes. Right. So she, so hasn't, she hasn't changed. She's kept her. Yeah. She, she's, she's kept her stringencies for herself only. Right. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's very nice. Uh, you know, like I said, we, we try to, to uh, be stringent with ourselves and, and be more careful as long as you're not imposing on others who don't have to. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with being with taking on beautiful customs, especially since there's reason and rhyme, purpose behind the custom, that's okay. Yeah, I, I would say as long as it doesn't tear a family apart. You know, uh, I had a rabbi who used to tell me always, he used to always announce in the kola because kola is where people study in the first year after marriage. He'd say, don't forget, you're getting married, you just got married, you know, your wife's family might have a different custom than you. Don't let that be a faribble, a fight. There's no reason for it to be a dispute. You'll find a way to work it out. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right, any other questions? 
All right, with that, we will conclude. And please, God, we'll have another shear tomorrow and Thursday. Friday will be too hectic. Hopefully, Thursday, I can give a shear as well, depending on our schedule. But I like giving shear. I like learning with you guys. So hopefully, I'll be able to do it regardless. Okay. Zach, Thank everyone? you, Rabbi. Thank Pleasure. you, Rabbi. Be well. We'll see you soon.